I, uh, my name is Glenn Page. I was born in Brockton, Massachusetts. I'm 82 years old. I uh, went to Rochester High School in New Hampshire, then Phillips Exeter Academy, then to Princeton University, Harvard, and later at Northwestern for a PhD. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as family goes, my father was the YMCA uh, social secretary. And, uh, uh, and uh, also, I'm uh, uh, part of my family are uh, Portuguese immigrants from the Azores who came to Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, whaling, uh, seamen, uh, uh, coast guard, lifeguard workers in Massachusetts and so forth on the on the side. And uh, my I told my mother's side, my father's side have. A lot of teachers mm -hmm. in the high school teachers and and uh, uh, grammar school teacher. My grandma taught the first and second grade in the same room for 44 years <laughs> in, in northeastern Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Uh, so you're coming from the, uh, the education family, family of education. Well, yeah, it's it's it's. Yes, two, two, two sides, I think. One is uh, actually three sides. One is uh, social service. The YMC secretary is working for uh, young men and young women, sports clubs mm -hmm. and summer camps and uh, Thanksgiving uh, baskets and things like that. And then the teacher's side, they were bringing books to me as a child and so forth. And the third side is is uh, to to be uh, having a sense of not uh, in terms of ethnicity is being part Portuguese. The origin of it, uh, I entered uh, Princeton University as a freshman, 1947 mm -hmm. and 1948. I was there one year. I dropped out and I joined the army. And I spent four years in the army. During that time, it took me to Korea, in 1950 to 52. And uh, in 1952, I went back to Korea. I wrote the dean of students from a pup tent in Korea and said, uh, I'm ready to come back. He says, all right, come back. And I graduated in 1955. So uh, I'd been inspired by a... Uh, a very uh, creative uh, a po a politics professor at Princeton, uh, Richard C. Snyder. He was the pioneer in decision-making mm -hmm. analysis, yes. how to introduce uh, decision analysis of decisions uh, to understand international politics. Mm -hmm. For him, it wasn't just economics or history or geography or balance of power and so forth. The idea was, if you want to understand why nations go to war, don't go to war, or make the various policies, you want to know who is making those decisions. So it's usually a 10 or 15 people in the uh, uh, top. So as an undergraduate, since I've been in the war, he was my teacher. So in 1952-55, I wrote my Princeton uh, thesis Princeton requires uh, every student to write a graduation thesis. So I wrote it on the United States' decision to resist aggression in the Korean War. Mm. I used uh, Professor Snyder's decision-making framework to guide me. When was it? 1950? 1955. Five. And I went to Harvard for two years, and I wanted to study the Korean language. and. Uh, I wanted to learn everything about Korea. I I'd studied Russian and Chinese at Princeton. Oh. They didn't offer any Korean. Harvard didn't either, so I went to Harvard for two years to study the East Asian, uh, the master's program in East Asian. So I studied Chinese, Japanese, and, and, uh, and Korean at Harvard for two years. Then I went to Northwestern for an interdisciplinary uh, degree in political science. 
Professor Snyder had moved from Princeton to Northwestern was the chair. So I was very much interested in that. And he was the one that advised me you could combine your area interest in Korea and East Asia with uh, interdisciplinary approach to political science. And uh, that department was, was very interdisciplinary with joint appointments, psychology, social psychology, anthropology. And Professor Snyder encouraged us as graduate students to look at all sources of knowledge, not just to the narrow political, legal, institutional matter. Mm -hmm. So I, I completed that degree in 1959. Uh, uh, PhD degree. Yes. Yes. And then I was invited by the University of Minnesota to go to Korea to the uh, uh, the uh, University of Minnesota advisory group to Seoul National University to be a research advisor to the Graduate School of Public Administration. And uh, Minnesota had a program in uh, engineering, agriculture public administration and pediatrics. And I was a member of that group for, for two years. Then I returned back. Princeton then invited me back to join the faculty. So for 1961 to 67, uh, I was on the faculty at Princeton University. Mm -hmm. Then I resigned and came to Hawaii. To, I wanted to build a Korean center in the United States, and Princeton uh, was, would be interested, but there weren't enough students or uh, to to really support that and so forth. So, but Hawaii was very receptive to it. I also wanted to study political leadership studies and teach course about that. Princeton wasn't interested in that mm -hmm. either because Princeton said we all teach. Uh, but all, all our students are leaders. We don't need a course on political leadership. So, but to go back to your, to your question, without uh, the, the Korean War experience was the origin of my interest in Koreans as a people. I saw the, uh, I saw the Japanese en route to Korea when a sh ship stops over. I saw the Russians' influence in Pyongyang when we got to them. And I saw the Chinese, I saw them killed. And our division, you know, we killed them. And I, so I saw them all. So I became much interested, mainly from the Korean people's point of view, but I experienced the other, uh, the other four cultures at the same time. So it just carried over into my academic work. So I wanted to know, uh, studying political science, how the decision was made so my study involved uh, eventually interviewing President Harry Truman. I was about 1957, mm -hmm. former president, and Secretary of State and Defense. And so that's well known in the book, The Korean Decision. And every chapter is what the top decision makers did every day, mm -hmm. from June 24th to June 30th at that time. So that's. That, that's the origin of what I did, and uh, that's that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. The war was the start. Mm -hmm. If I had been that war, I wouldn't have done mm -hmm. any of that. Uh, there are uh, several reasons. Um, one, one thing, I wanted to get married. You couldn't be married and be a, a, a student at Princeton at that time. <laughs> it was all male and so forth. That's one thing. Uh, Secondly, I, I was a product of World War II, the war propaganda, you know, of a patriotic war. Mm -hmm. And about 1948, that 748, it was expected we were going to fight Russia and the, uh, the uh, Eastern European uh, Iron Curtain era and so forth. So I thought, well, I was going to, uh, to be part of that and so forth. American then, patriotism. Then I needed money. I had no money. Mm. You know, I didn't have a job. And you know, it's a co co combination of this uh, socialization and uh, and personal interest, and uh, I guess uh, a kind of patriotism. But it, it, 
it's, it's, it's very complex mm -hmm. from that mm -hmm. because uh, I was a musician at the time and uh, a musician a musician yeah I, and I had, uh, I was a, a, I played the saxophone and I was in the Princeton marching band and uh, and in uh, other bands and so forth so I I was I was interested first to uh, Join the Navy and get in the School of Music, where they had a course teaching you composition, and it was a very good school. But I went to the Navy, but I had to wait for like two years. They had too many, so I oh. went to the Army. Recruited, and they said, "Oh, uh, it will, if you sign up, we'll send you to the uh, uh, Army Band in Fort Monroe, Virginia. You won't have to go to basic training because." already in ROTC. Oh, you were in the ROTC? So, yes, yes, okay. it was for one year. And so they said, we'll, we'll send you right to the band. You can go right there and take your uh, thing. And uh, so I signed up, but they never sent me. They mm. just sent me to basic training for eight weeks and so forth. And eight weeks? Said, oh, yeah, it's the basic training of the time at Fort Dix. And then I went to uh, sergeant school, and I said, no more of this. And I played for Officer Candidate School, and I went to, uh, into uh, Officer Candidate School for six. Then they sent me to the Artillery School in Fort, uh, uh, in uh, El Paso, uh, uh, Texas, Fort Bliss, and I, uh, I uh, uh, graduated about in the spring of 1950 assigned to the uh, first, second infantry division in uh, in Fort Lewis, assigned to the 10th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Group as a second lieutenant, mm -hmm. and got there about May, June, and then the Korean War broke out, and then they assigned, they sent our unit, the second division was sent to Korea, and I arrived there with the 10th Anti Aircraft Artillery Group on uh, September 4th, 1950, in Busan. 1950 in Busan. So that's that's the, that's kind of that's a story of dropping out from Princeton, <laughs> getting in the army, trying to follow, uh, uh, trying trying to combine a lot of different things: music interests, personal interests, patriotism. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not a simple story about any any person's life. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not, not easy to sum up in uh, two three sentences. So let's say it's a complex start to uh, at 82. I have a much clearer idea of of what is important, mm -hmm. and I have a much uh, a better grasp of this. What was the kind of uh social mood in America in late 1940s and how that was related to the Korean War. What was people's reaction to that when you first heard about it? Well, I, I, I think uh, after 1945, of course, there was a big demobilization in the United States to mobilize the army and then all the things had been rationed and uh, to build tanks and airplanes and so forth. They had to reconvert the big, you know, washing machines, refrigerators and automobiles and things. So that was going on. And, but after 1948, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the uh, Iron Curtain, the uh, Soviet uh, tension between the, uh, in the, Eastern Europe, the Soviet occupation, and the, the tension between the United States and and Russia, Stalin, uh, Truman, Churchill. There was a there was a real sense of uh, Cold War that communism is is coming. So it wasn't a relaxed time of uh, it was a real sense of t tension and the calculations. What's going on? And the Chinese uh, Civil War, you've you got to put the Chinese Civil War into this. And yes. 1949 is a triumph of communism that Chinese have stood up. Mm -hmm. They stood up, you know. 
and so uh, there's a tension uh, in the United States. You're going to have a struggle with communism. It's dangerous. That's the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the Korean War breaks out, of course, well, here's an example of a communist country attacking uh, uh, one of our friends. We don't know much about our friends, but uh, it was supposed to be democratic. America didn't know it was not all that democratic. They didn't know there had been a lot of killing inside of Korea, uh, north and south. They didn't know everything that happened since 1945 to 48. They don't know anything about the butchery on Jeju Island. Or they, don't, they don't know anything about this. And But it's just the good, the good guys are being attacked by the bad guys. And uh, uh, But even then, you know, as I found out in my book, even the Washington pundits and the newspapers didn't expect Truman was going to do anything. Mm -hmm. They didn't think, think that the U.S. did. So his decision right away, uh, September, I mean, uh, June 24, 25th, was, was quite a surprise. But then, when the United States gets into a war, and whether people like it or not, it's only a small minority that really object uh, terribly at first. So, uh, most people accepted that, and then, then there was a big military buildup. Mm -hmm. big, a budget went up, and they developed NATO, and that attack from North Korea really militarized the United States. It might have been on a less trajectory toward a more peaceful demobilization if the United States had gotten along with Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong wanted to uh, uh, sort of make peace with the United States, but uh, Truman rejected that. And uh, you know, we, we could have been on a more friendly for the with them in 1950, along that area. Mm -hmm. But that attack in Korea just made it bad for everybody. It made it militarize the Chinese. It, uh, it uh, made a miracle of Japanese eco economic recovery because they benefited from all the, uh, the American buildup to back up the, the, the thing. And it, you know, it, Ter terrible influence on the people of South Korea, militarized the North Korea. It's just a disaster mm -hmm. all the way around. Mm -hmm. So those of us, what are us, five, six million of us, and plus all the other 21 countries, I think we're most of us young people. We weren't uh, political strategists or anything. We're all just human beings caught up in our uh, personal, uh, you know, lives and. Uh, uh, soldiers do what they are ordered to do, and you know, and they all participate, mm -hmm. and everyone's a victim of it, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the people suffered. The people suffered most for the Korean people from all this, and Chinese were number two. Yeah. I think uh, what well, maybe the figures are the figures about the dead and casualties of war are still not clear. Uh, so, I know there, I won't get into it, but you can go to Google and you look at it. Mm -hmm. Do some research. It's, it's really complicated. You just point... Anyway, let, me, let me add one more thing. Sure, sure, sure. The, you can edit this out. Yeah. If you want, but I, uh, I went to uh, check uh, how, how many uh, served in the Korean War and how many casualties mm -hmm. and how many dead. I did it last night just to refresh my memory. So 5.7 served and 1.7 served in the Korean theater. 33,641 dead and 103,000 something uh, injured more than that. So I I looked up uh, how many uh, how many dead were killed in all American wars since the American Revolution, mm -hmm. all the way down to, to 2011. It's about 650,000 were killed in all of American history, mm -hmm. including World War II, 
Mm -hmm. The American Civil War, North and South, dead. About 600, almost 632,000. Almost 600, 600, almost 650,000. If you add them up, uh, something like 1.2 million Americans have been killed in combat. I'm not mentioning the, the casualties of uh, civilians, 1.2. So then I thought, well, you know, that's, that's really not so many. It's not as many as were killed in Korea. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, Koreans lost more. So I said, uh, go look at the Russians in mm -hmm. World War II. 8.8 .8 million soldiers were killed from 1939 to 1945. Mm -hmm. And I forget how many uh, wounded, was it 14 million or something. Yeah. So uh, it, it gave me an, an, a nice perspective on uh, the, the American uh, attitude toward war the American understanding of war. For us, it seems very terrible that we've been very, we've been victimized. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're under attack and we've suffered a lot. And so we have to be terribly strong to do that. So I was just thinking about uh, trying to look at it from other people's perspective, what kind of suffering they yes. They did. The place to start was in 1945 when the American troops occupied South Korea and the Russian troops occupied North Korea. And the Americans uh, and the Russians, for various reasons, and the Koreans themselves uh, didn't unify themselves. And the, Korea, the South Koreans the North Koreans, as I understand, they went in and they just ejected all the Japanese police and their military and everything, get out. The Americans maintained the, American, the Japanese system in South Korea. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the judiciary and more of the police, and of course the civilians left in so many. So the, Ameri the Russians treated North Korea like a liberated country and the Americans treated it like uh, not, uh, occupied Japan. It was an occupied country, mm -hmm. so we occupied it. So. Now, if, if in the Syngman Rhee had, uh, in the South had objected to, you know, the trusteeship idea, it could have been under a UN trusteeship, which has worked out to unify countries and so forth, but that was objected to mainly by South Korea. I think Stalin agreed to a 40-year trusteeship mm -hmm. with the United States. That was 1947, so. So there's all kinds of reasons for that uh, 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 leading to a, 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 an antagonism and, and uh, the butcheries that went on in South Korea, the right-wing people attacking the uh, so-called communists and in the South, and the butchering people and the revenge and the things in the North that were done by Koreans against uh, Christians and pastors and so the Koreans they made their own war. So the, the fact that the United States and Atchison and the United States was trying to avoid war with the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. they were trying to avoid war with China, and uh, they, they had good reports from their military attaches and their military advisory group. The South Korean army was far superior to the North Korean army. That was the intelligence expert at that time. That was the estimate turned out to be wrong, mm -hmm. but there's all that, so it's, it's a complicated, I'm sorry Professor Han, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you a, a neat answer to this business. I think everybody's involved in this. It's not only Atchison, it's Stalin, it's Mao, mm -hmm. it's Truman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the Japanese, it's uh, Syngman Rhee, it's Kim Il-sung, it's their advisors, it's uh, American intelligence officers in the army, and diplomats, it's Russian generals and 
people there and so forth. It's a very complex matter. Mm -hmm. The only answer I would give to this, not to avoid this in mm -hmm. the future, mm -hmm. is that all six parties, North Korea, South Korea, America, Russia, China, and Japan, the leaders of that, those societies, all have one clear ethical commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. And we will not kill in Korea. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And we will settle all our problems of economic security, political, cultural, economic, in a peaceful way. We won't arm to kill. We won't threaten to kill. We won't assassinate to kill. Mm -hmm. We won't torture. We won't execute. That's it. So my, my answer to the Korean War is three words. No more killing. No more killing. Now, I don't think conventional political science can get to that answer. And I don't think conventional policy makers in Beijing, Moscow, Washington, especially Tokyo, Seoul, or Pyongyang mm -hmm. can get to that answer either. It's going to take new research, interdisciplinary research, intercultural research, new education and policy development, and a careful transformational work. It's deliberate. First, it's, it's, it's like going to the moon. Can you go to the moon? Everyone says, no, impossible. Can you have a non-killing Korea? No, impossible. But we got to the moon, and we could get to the we could get to a Korea that, that in which Koreans don't kill each other, and the, the Russians, the Chinese, Japanese, Americans aren't going to kill any Koreans, and they're not really armed to do that. So that's where I've come to from the war. I mean, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You can talk to me for hours, and I would just come out to that. And the other things I'm saying uh, would be, they're very minor, very minor, and the reasons behind why I think that's possible is in the published book, Global, Non-Killing Global Political Science. It's, on, it's free on the website, nonkilling.org. Anybody in the world can read it. Mm -hmm. It's now being, tra it's been translated to 23 languages in nine years. Mm -hmm. And in total, uh, many more are coming. And what is your non-conventional approach? Well, I, I think the origin of it uh, starts with those three words, no more killing. And that, those words came to me about 1974. At that time, I was a professor of political science at the University of Hawaii. And on behalf of the University of Hawaii, I was trying to make contact with the Academy of Science of uh, uh, the uh, DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, from Hawaii. And we were, our president here, uh, President Harvin Cleveland, former ambassador to NATO, uh, was uh, president of our university. And he was receptive to this, so I was, I was uh, just a faculty member, and I was trying to make contact with the uh, uh, North Korean uh, scholars to bring them to the United States. And of course, in this is 74, 1974, and uh, I'd seen uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger do some ping pong diplomacy with uh, China, uh, non-military and non-diplomatic, you know, private. So I sort of, I think I was, you know, sort of following along that thing, just an individual scholar. Well, I, I made some contact in various international conferences with North Korean scholars. I met them in uh, Paris, in uh, uh, International Congress of Orientalists, and other places. And they were they were very receptive. They would send fly scholars and uh, linguists, uh, uh, um, uh, historian, uh, um, uh, sociologist, and so forth. But to, to sum it all up, I found that the, the main objective to that initiative, even though I carried our, uh, our president's letter to the uh, 
delegates' mounds at the United Nations and handed it to the observer mission of the DPRK in 1974-73 in that area. Uh, and uh, the U.S. government is completely against that, the, and the State Department, and also the American Embassy, and the Korean Embassy in Washington was absolutely against it. These are communists, they can't come to the United States. Uh, we're against it, and we won't do it. So at that time, it wasn't very calculated, but i have written this book on the Korean War, mm -hmm. the Korean decision. Basically, I, uh, that, that decision had said, this is a good, you know, it's a good decision. People would ask me, is this a good decision? Was it right they did that? So in the last chapters of my book, uh, I, I said, well, I looked at all the other answers and said, well, it's right. You know, South Korea is more democratic than North Korea, and so forth. So I'd already been on uh, on record as describing a war decision, and also not not, not cheering for it completely, but being pretty you know favorable. I agreed with with Truman and the people who, who made that decision. So here I am in 74, I'm trying to make, we, we fought a war for peace and freedom in Korea. And I'm trying to make peace with a former enemy. Mm -hmm. I have to add one more thing. I have to back up a little bit. I have to add one more element. In 1959 and 60, I was in Seoul. I was at the time of the April 19th student revolution, mm -hmm. Sa Il Gu yeah. insult, I was there. I marched with the students. I, I was an observer. I wasn't on the front rank. But I marched with them from the SNU campus right up to Gyeongmu Day. I saw the police shoot them, and they killed them and wounded them. I was part of that. Now, that was a student, nonviolent student demonstration for democracy. And for nine months, there was freedom in South Korea. There was an election in August, and I did some uh, village uh, administration work in uh, villages in Pajugun, and interviewed the Rhee Chief Myung Jang and uh, various people, and it was a big, uh, everyone was free for the first time in a couple thousand years. And then, nine months later, coup d'etat, mm -hmm. oh, il Park jung hee took over. And uh, so I'd been through that springtime of freedom, then military dictatorship, and then Park maintained his dictatorship till 1979, 18 years until he was killed by his own CIA chief at a Kisang party. So here I am. <clears throat> I'm a former soldier involved in a war, uh, killing people become a scholar, write a book justifying a war, and fighting for freedom and peace, and I see in our friends in the South, it becomes a military dictatorship, uh -huh. and in, in the trying to make peace, I find that our friends and own government are against even a, a uh, private citizen's attempt at peaceful, it's called citizen diplomacy or something. Mm -hmm. Now it wasn't done calculated, in a calculated way. I didn't sit down and calculate all this stuff. I just felt one, one day the words came to me from my, in other words, it was electric current. I was standing up from the tips of my toes right up through the top of my head. Mm -hmm. And three silent words came to mm -hmm. me. No more killing. Hmm. Now, uh, later, you know, I studied some social psychology. So, uh, one one psychological ex ex explanation of that is called cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. That is when your values and reality conflict. Then what do you do? You can change your values. Or you can change reality, or you can withdraw. You can become an alcoholic, mm -hmm. promiscuous, drug addict, or something. So 
I could change my values and say, okay, I don't care about freedom and the dictatorship is good for economic development and uh, the enemy are nasty so we don't need to deal with them at all. So the way to have freedom is to kill them and we'll make peace. So I could change my <laughs> peace value and I, I, and, uh, and I could just deny the reality and say, okay, just let the status quo go mm -hmm. and keep on my job and everything is all right. But what happened to me was the value changed. Instead of, instead of political science is the science of power, power is based on violence, so I study violence. I once asked a very senior uh, professor uh, of, uh, uh, back in the 1950s uh, at uh, professor at the University of Chicago. I was a young fellow at Princeton. And I asked him, uh, tell me what what is it you study? You're, you've studied political science all your life. What is, what is the political science? And he said, I study the death-dealing power of the state. Mm -hmm. So anyway, all right. So here I am in 74, suddenly no more killing. And then, I, so, okay, so now what do I do? I'm a professor, I've written a book about this, and what do I do? So the first thing I did, it took me almost three years, I wrote a book review of my own book, a Korean Your decision. own book? Uh -huh. Yes, it was published in the American Political Science Review in December 1977. Issue of December, it, it, it's in my bibliography. Okay. See it. Mm -hmm. December, it's called On Values and Science, the Korean Decision Reconsidered. Yeah, I think I wrote Yeah. And uh, it took about two years, three anonymous readers, uh, book re two or three book review editors. It's the first time in the history of the American Political Science Review since 1906, uh, 71 years that an author was ever allowed to review their own book. Mm -hmm. And the, the anonymous reviewers said, they said 95% of political science will, will not agree with this, his criticism of his own his book. Own book. Mm -hmm. But since the book was used so widely in training uh, in political science, in graduate school, in strategic, studies in Germany and West Point academies, Korea and Japan. It was, it was all used by the military strategists. Since it was used so widely, we should publish it, mm -hmm. even though we won't agree with it, but since the book was known. So then, the next thing I did was to raise the same question to the entire discipline of political science. It took 28 years of studying the history of political philosophy and psychology and anthropology and societies and histories and nonviolence and action. And I visited many countries. I went to India to study yeah. Gandhi. I went to the South to study Martin Luther King. And I, I, I went all over the place. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it took me 28 years to publish the book in 2002. In the, in, the court, in the process of this, I retired in 1992. In 1994, I founded a Center for Global Nonviolence. I use the word nonviolence at the time. And it was nonprofit. But it was, it was incubated inside the University of Hawaii in the Matsunaga Peace Institute. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of planning project. In 94, I took it out of there as independent, uh, outside the university system, non-governmental, non-university. It's a real innovation. At that mm -hmm. time, non-violence. At that time, there wasn't one peace course in the University of, uh, of Hawaii. 
I think right now in the American political science, there's no peace section. There's 90 specialties in the, in the political science uh, profession, but I don't think there's any peace one. American psychological one has one, mm -hmm. peace and conflict. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it's, it's, so I, I took it out of there, and then I placed that non-killing global political science book uh, when I finally published it in 2002, self-published, put it on the website mm -hmm. free, mm -hmm. so anybody in the world could get it. And that led, by 2007, five years later, I was able to bring 40 leaders and scholars uh, to, uh, from 20 countries here to the, uh, actually the Murang South Temple, Buddhist Temple here in Hawaii for three days. That was just a site we organized it at our center on a, a global non-killing uh, leadership forum, and that uh, we had uh, scholars uh, and uh, leaders from Russia, China, Africa, Latin America, Europe. Uh, had all the whole world was represented there, and they'd all read the book, and some were translators of the book, and so forth. So that. That, that showed, that demonstrated the, 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 the interest in the world in the concept of non-killing. Because I've read that non-killing book, mm -hmm. and the non-killing book gives you some reasons why to do this. So in, uh, we then got some support in 19, in 2000. 9, 10, 11, we've had support the Center for Global, we changed the name to Center for Global Non-Killing. The mission of the Center for Global Non-Killing is to promote change toward the measurable goal of a killing-free world mm -hmm. by means open to infinite creativity in reverence for life. That's the mission. Mm -hmm. The two parts of that mission statement are, are interesting. First, it's measurable. You can count the bodies, you can count the dead, you can count the murders, other suicides. They're, they're, they're countable. It's measurable. Strictly measurable. You can't measure peace, you can't measure democracy, goodness, justice. Those things people have fought and killed over for for centuries, uh, quite abstract, the uh, Greek abstractions in a way. So it's measurable, and it's open-ended. That is not totalitarian. It isn't that it has to be a certain kind of economy, politics, religion, culture, language, sports, whatever. It's open. So the question is, what kind of society is it where people don't kill each mm -hmm. other, or mm -hmm. prepare to kill each other, or use their resources to do it, arm themselves to do it, and create cultures of killing that, that celebrate it and suffer from it. What kind of society is that? So what would a non-killing Hawaii be like? What would a non-killing America be like? What would non-killing Syracuse University be like? Or, or, or non-killing Russia, non-killing China, non-killing North Korea, non-killing South Korea. What would they be like? And uh, so it's uh, the 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 uh, the mission is very clear and very open to creativity. So what I what we found happens is when people do read the book and takes the book. The way it's, it persuades you, it persuades the reader to go from pessimism, it's absolutely unthinkable, to it, we ought to take it seriously. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. And then it, beyond that, it's up to all of us, what are we going to do about mm -hmm. it? That's the idea. And the notion is there's not one center for global non-killing. There are seven billion of us on the planet. Every, every person is a center for global non-killing. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to be. Because when you take a non-killing uh, approach uh, to life, every single person becomes very important 
obviously you don't want them to kill. You don't want them to be a pathological killer. Mm -hmm. You don't want them to be armed with a massive kill capacity. Even one person can now kill millions with appropriate technology. So every person is, is interested, poor, rich, middle, whatever it is. When you maintain the notion that I'll kill to protect myself, I'll kill to protect my uh, family, my sake, and so forth, you don't need to be so careful about every human, the well-being of every human being. What is their economic status? Mm -hmm, what is mm -hmm. their happiness status? What is their family? Or what is their, how, how are they? How are they? How? You don't have to care so much because if they, if they do something bad, you can arrest them, or you can execute them, or you can exterminate them uh, by some way, a drones or a atomic bombs or whatever, or with your gun or your machine guns or whatever you want to do, a knife, or you just kill it. Mm. But if you don't want to do that, you have to you have to see how can we all live on this planet, and it, it, it relates to uh, decreasing the violence of the planet and the demilitarization of the yep. planet, and c closing the rich-poor gap so there's much more sharing of resources, mm -hmm. so sort of much more respect for human rights, mm -hmm. and everyone has to be respected, and has to be much more care for the environment, because if we don't take care of the planet, the planet's going to kill us, and it's uh, Barry Conner wrote a book called War on the Planet. If you make war on the planet, you're going to lose, and that's the, the war. The, global warming and all the other matters. And then we have to learn how to get together. Uh, all of us on the planet, together we have to work out how to make decisions and, and to solve the problem of violence, economics, human rights, and the environment, and getting along together, we have to figure out how to do that. And to me, if we go back to Korean culture, I think it could, could be the Tangun era, Hongi mm -hmm. Inga. Hongi Inga. I think Koreans understand this instinctively. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take any foreigner to, to tell that to Koreans, especially. So I look, I look, I'm very optimistic about Korea and Korean culture. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, and um, the dynamism of it and those basic values, it's really deep in that in that peninsula, and it's really distinct, distinctive, and uh, has a tremendous potential if, uh, if uh, uh, just allowed to, allowed to flourish, allowed to make it more gently, let it come out, and, and nurture it by uh, Korean leadership, and, and I think Korean scholars have a, a, a good role to play, because Korean the scholars uh, traditionally were respected and they're responsible for the hangul and cultural interventions and values and, and uh, uh, so I, I, I'm quite, I'm quite, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful about this. That's why this book that we're going to publish in a couple of weeks, uh, Non-Killing uh, non Korea, Six Culture Exploration, is an attempt to look at non-killing cultural uh, capabilities in Russia, China, Japan, the U.S., and, and North Korea and South Korea. It's the first time such a book has ever been, mm -hmm. ever been uh, attempted. And I think uh, it, it would be co-published by the Seoul National University Press, mm -hmm. the Asia Center. I think it's number two in their new series. I'm hoping it will find a way somewhere through into, uh, into scholars' hands in North Korea or abroad in, in their various embassies and, and so forth that it will get into, into, uh, into the North. And uh, I'm hoping in, in the future that there'd be a conference to bring uh, Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Americans, North, South, get together and discuss that book, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, book itself, mm -hmm, crit mm -hmm. criticize it, and then decide what what would happen. This mm -hmm. is just a very minor step. But without this, uh, getting back to your research on veterans of the mm -hmm. Korean War, 
this would not not have happened mm -hmm. without that experience. Right. It's just one person's, just one 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 veteran's person, and I it, 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 I would say it just it just happened. It happened. I think I think the basic. I, I, I've not thought too clearly about this till now, so I'm talking to you right now. I say, what was the reason for that? I think it's one word. I think it's love. Mm -hmm. Saram. Saram. Somehow, Saram. Somehow. I, I, and it, it's, uh, I, I, I lived in a Buddhist temple for one month in 1972 in Saraksan, Shin Hung Sa, for one month. And uh, I didn't know anything about Buddhism. I was writing uh, 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 an article about the uh, future of political leadership in an informational society be to be published in Japan. This is 1972. Up there. And I lived in the temple and just followed what the monks did and ate what they did and write in the morning and go in the afternoon. So I, I participated in all the, uh, the morning and the bells and the prayers. And I, they, they just said, well, just do what we do. You know, I wasn't studying Buddhism or anything. I just was living with it. And one of the monks said to me, I think you must have, you must have been a Korean. Mm. When you were, you know, there's a sense you must have some Korean in you, you know. DNA. Yeah, there's something there, you know. So it was a kind of, a kind of love with the culture, and so much about the culture, mm -hmm. the architecture, the roof, the, even even the uh, even in the wartime, even in parts of North Korea, I never felt afraid among Koreans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 